I've got a proposition for you. Suppose that in the near future, some type of alien intelligence that is obviously extraterrestrial shows up at planet Earth and says, yes, we are part of a organization that is tasked with allowing budding civilizations that are of Kardashev type zero settle their surroundings in environments that are particularly hospitable to them. In this case, we are told that around the star Eta Crucis, there is a solar system. And in that solar system, there happens to exist the seventh planet from the sun. And that seventh planet from the sun, we are told, has oceans. And then they show you the picture of the coronagraph of the star. And it looks like we can see about three or four planets. And there's a picture of planet seven. And it's about four pixels. And the word is that if you can put a mission together, uh, they will take care of the faster than light travel. They will take you from, from low Earth orbit and they will stick you in orbit around this particular planet uh, with not much else known. So that being said, would you go? Would you actually do it? This is Dr. Aeronautics and welcome to my latest video series in space, which is the Eta Crucis System Exploration Mission. I should mention that this science theme is modern and it is unfolding right now. If you search Ocean Planet and take a look at the news, there's talk about this thing called K2-18b, which is supposedly an ocean planet or a Haitian world. Um, there's plenty of things coming up. The TRAPPIST-1 system people are curious about. Uh, it is a really budding topic, so this is very, very relevant to today's discussions. So we're going to do this exactly the way we did the General Order Space Mission number one mission, uh, with the exception of we're not returning, and the technology level is a heck of a lot higher because it's going to involve the use of 3D printer design and mothership operations, okay? So we're going to start from the very beginning, defining everything, uh, hashing out the tech levels, um, showing the checklists, and then starting with the next episode, we're going to fly to the Ada Crucis system. So the very first thing to do is to select our destination, which we're told is Ada Crucis 7. Uh, the, the description that we have for this planet is that it's a panthalassic or super oceanic planet. That is to say, the ocean is so extensive that it covers the entire world. There is no dry land. Um, it just so turns out that if you take a look at the eccentricity, um, that value that we have offset from the um, obliquity of the planet, the planet is tipped at about 57 degrees so it's going to have some super super seasons and it is also um, has an eccentricity of 0.14 and those effects actually kind of compound um, so we need to be fairly close to the equator but not too close to the equator because when you have a 57 degree axial tilt the poles actually become the hot zones and the equator becomes the cold area um, so the balance point is about 30 degrees south. We're, we want to target roughly morning time so that we have as much time as possible to set things up when we land there. And with the place that's sending us off from Earth will be Cape Canaveral itself. So what we want to do when we get to the destination, the very next episode, our goal is going to be to land on this planet, 7 because it's the seventh planet from the sun, we're calling it Eta Crucis 7. That is our ocean world. We want to establish a supply line from the moons because you can't get copper. You can't get 
silicon. You can't get iron from a oceanic planet. There's a bottomless ocean. It's it's essentially bottomless. It's not really, but it, it is going to be so deep on the order of 50 miles or so that there's no way we're ever going to be able to, to even see the bottom. Um, and when I say see the bottom, I mean send a submersible down. No, nothing can, can survive that kind of pressure. Um, that is about five times deeper or more, de depending on <laughs> just how deep it is. Um, once, once we get there, that's about five times deeper than the, than the Marianas Trench. Um, so there, there are moons surrounding this. There, there are, are two, two large moons around, uh, planet seven. And our goal is to characterize and see if we can build a base on those moons and they will, um, provide the raw resources that will then, uh, continue to the, into the mothership. And we will send those down to the surface on seven, where we use the uh, the ocean to essentially live. We're we're basically a nonstop cruise ship, but we have to be supplied while we're underway. Um, and we want to try to establish a mothership refueling sit, uh, station on the moon itself, because at some point the mothership is going to run out of fuel, and we're not going back to the Earth uh, once the once the friendly extraterrestrials drop us off, uh, we sign a piece of paper that says, yes, you've done your job, and they are off to the next star system, leaving us without a faster than light travel option to return. And then eventually we want to try to reach Adacrucis 8, which is uh, another very large planet in the system. Uh, solid ice is the understanding of what this thing is. And, you know, it's pretty nice to live on some dry land with high gravity every once in a while, right? Um, the disadvantage is it's not very nice when you go outside. You're, gr you're greeted with a uh, gusty wind and very cold uh, climate. Um, seven is already cold uh, from, from my understanding. So, um, Eta Crucis itself is actually an F-type main sequence star. It's an F25. Uh, a, our sun is a G25. So, when you talk about stars, um, when you go from cold to hot, you have M-class stars followed by K, G, F, A, B, and O. So, if you have a B or an O star... Uh, you're basically not going to be able to get out of the spacecraft because the ultraviolet light is so severe that you would just basically immediately crisp up and get skin cancer. Uh, with, a, with an A-type star, you'd probably have to wear some sort of protective sheen at all the time. Um, we have an F-type star, which is the next step up from our own sun. So what that means is tons of zinc oxide on the skin, uh, we're probably going to need to wear polarized sunglasses all the time um, when the when the Eta Crucis is up. Uh, most likely long sleeve, long pants uh, kind of clothing, um, dry suits and wet suits as possible, and UV protected windows. Uh, so it's not entirely uh, impossible, but we do have to respect the high UV light. And things are going to break down faster uh, because of that. I've been told that Eta Crucis 7 has rings, so we have to be careful when we uh, navigate through the orbits there. Um, additionally, the six inward planets from 7 uh, have varying degrees of high temperatures, and we have to be very careful. Uh, these range in, you know, Venus-like from 4, 5, and 6, where they're basically you know, dozens of atmospheres and nearly a thousand degrees all the way up to a mercury analog uh, for three. And two is a hot ice giant, which we don't have. And one is basically Mustafar, except the air is 2,000, 2000 degrees Kelvin or 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit. I don't think we're going there anytime soon. And Planet 8 is very large, making it a gravity well, and we need to be very careful that we don't end up stuck there. 
because if we don't take enough fuel to take off from Ada Crucis 8 and we can't successfully build a resupply base to resupply us with fuel, uh, we're kind of stuck on the surface forever. And that's bad. We don't want to get stuck at Planet 8. So we, we have some mitigation that, that I have. Um, so what capabilities of flight do we want to be capable of? Well, I want to be able to free flight in an atmosphere like an airplane. And I want to be able to um, space flight interplanetary. Um, we can do local via the, um, via the space plane. Um, but I am okay. And really the, the only real way that we can do this using somewhat modern technologies is using the mothership. And I want to be able to do a little bit of aero braking as well to save on fuel. Um, so as far as taking off and landing, the idea is that we should be able to uh, vertical takeoff and land um, and airplane, depending on the thickness of the atmospheres. Um, I think the results came back with Ada Crucis 7 has an atmosphere of about half a bar, um, which is you know half an atmosphere. Uh, Ada Crucis 10, I, I think that's one tenth of an atmosphere. And 11, I think, is one one hundredth of an atmosphere. So that's enough to fly like an airplane, but it's varying degrees of there's air versus there's, there's not really enough air to get outside of a space suit. Um, for 6 and 8, those have very thick atmospheres. They have very high gravity, too. Um, so in that case, we're really only going to be able to use an airplane because we can't generate enough vertical thrust. Um, for for nine for planet nine and the airless moons, there's no way we're going to be able to take off like an airplane. There's just not enough air, so then we'll have to vertical take off and land. Uh, I don't think I've mentioned it yet, but the Ada Crucis seven there's eleven planets from what we can tell. Um, as far as what I'm planning to bring, uh, we have a slide on that. We'll get to that. We also have some descent plans that kind of hash out exactly how we're going to set things up. Like normal, I'm going to use Excel to plan the mission, but unlike previous missions where I plan it beginning to end, this has no end. It's kind of like Cassini, where you just, you know, okay, what do we want to do the next week? Okay, let's do this. Make sure we get enough to get um, get back without running out of fuel. Okay, did we get back? Yes. Okay, refuel, and next week, what do we want to do? And repeat. Uh, we're going for 90% accuracy. We do not need 99%, and uh, the... The re one of the reasons for that is because we really don't understand all that the planets are going to give us in terms of uh, numbers. You know, We think we have an understanding of what the planets are like. Um, but if the numbers are off, then we, we, we might see some divergence. Uh, the overall goal here is to colonize the Eta Crucis system. Sort of like solar system co colonization, but do it on another star. Um, my mission abort criteria would be critical fuel or oxygen situation. That's the sort of like, uh, we really need to get back to the mothership now and figure out how to do that. Uh, so we have a, a, a fleet of vehicles to really do this. So um, the nearest systems uh, download has a, has a Prayon class uh, ship, which I'm calling ARC-2. Uh, that is going to be the um, spooky extraterrestrial technology that's going to take us to uh, from the sun to to Ada Crucis system. Um, our actual mothership is going to be a UCGO Aero class, which I'm naming the Space Viking, and our space plane is going to be an XR2 Raven Star, a custom profile based on the InStar mission, using the real test bed from the 19 from the late 1960s that was tested on the ground we're now taking that tested model and sticking two of them in an xr2 raven star and that is the propulsion system that we're using this is a propulsion system that has been developed and proven on the ground but nobody's attached it to a rocket yet Supposedly, they're actually going to do that very soon. I think Lockheed Martin is actually working a contract to do this. Um, so it's going to be very exciting. Uh, it's a very realistic ISP. It's about 1,024 ISP. About three times the, three times the ISP of a um, 
of a liquid hydrogen liquid oxygen reaction um, and it is a nuclear uh, solid fuel rocket and here's the great thing it's low enrichment only 20 percent which means that it, it is actually a nuclear fuel that civilians you know with the with the right um, credentials would be able to use as fuel on these sorts of systems so so the the whole idea of this mission is that we're using relatively modern technology a huge budget but with the exception of alien technology to bring us to another star for Ada Crucis 8 we're going to be using a booster which I'm calling the Valkyrie and that is hopefully fingers crossed gonna give us enough um, power to get off of the surface um, we're using a hydrocarbon scramjet because apparently Ada Crucis 7 has hydrocarbons in the atmosphere so unlike Earth where you take hydrocarbons like methane in your rocket or your your jet and you use oxygen from the atmosphere to power your jet in this case the hydrocarbons are in the air and we don't have oxygen in the air but we are taking it on board in an oxygen tank and then once we release it into the scramjet where the air which is composed of hydrocarbons is moving through we get a fuel reaction and that gets us a scramjet the downside is this is completely useless on any other planet that doesn't have a um, an atmosphere composed of hydrocarbons like the earth and like Ada Crucis 8 and a few other planets okay for our mission development plan you might notice the beautiful ship's wheel with the seven in it. That is the symbol, the, astro, the astrological symbol that I'm using for Ada Crucis 7, the, the Panthalassic Ocean World. Um, the reason I'm doing that is obviously the ship's wheel is reminiscent of an ocean, and it's the seventh planet from the sun. Um, so this is the exact same thing that, that you would see for the astrological symbols of what looks like a mating two and four for Jupiter. Um, an H with a cross through it for Saturn, um, the, uh, the male symbol for Mars, the, f the female symbol for Venus, uh, the female symbol with the weird eyebrow thing over it for, for Mercury. Um, so if you look up astrological symbols of the planets, I think it will come up. But anyway, this is just a, a really nice notation feature. Like if I don't have want to write out Ada Crucis 7, I just draw the ship's wheel with the 7 in it, and that works. Okay, so the, um, the, the 12 items here are what we're about to cover next. And we're going to hash them out more. All right, so here's, here's how our life support cycle is going to work, okay? We're going to land on Ada Crucis 7, well, really in. You know, it's, it, it's an ocean. We're going to splash down, um, sit on the surface. So what we're going to do is we're going to pump in uh, ocean water into an electrolyzer and and the understanding here is that the ocean water is going to be fresh water not salt water the reason that we think that's the case is because um, on earth the reasons that the earth oceans are salty is because rain falls on the land picks up sediment and the sediment contains the salt which then goes into the ocean but on a panthalassic planet where you have no land there's only water. There's only ocean. So it is very likely that we're going to be dealing with distilled water, which is really great. So the idea is we're going to pump it into an electrolyzer, electrolyze it, and that breaks it down to H2 and O2. Um, that will allow us to take hydrogen, um, hydrogen gas, which we will then use as remass for the nuclear rocket. Because the way the nuclear rocket works is it is a uh, solid nuclear fueled reactor and you pass cold gas in it in this case hydrogen over it and then suddenly it heats up to thousands of degrees and expands like an explosion that quickly so um, if we use hydrogen then we can just get that from the ocean water and then we take the oxygen and we can use the oxygen for breathing as well as compressing it and putting it into our scramjet tank 
to use as fuel to react with the hydrocarbons. And then drinking water and coolant water, you just simply bring those th from the ocean water and just run it through a simple filter. That's all you got to do. Um, the power source for all of this initially will be the ship reactor. And then once, once, once we get some, uh, some real estate, and we'll explain how to do that, uh, we, we will be able to build a solar farm and get all of this work in there. The great thing about having an F-class main sequence star means tons of energy. Uh, so, so that's a good thing. And then uh, waste, we're going to save that for farming. Uh, if it's something that we really don't want, like it's toxic or something, like spent nuclear fuel or something, weigh it down and send it to the bottom. We will never see it again. Um, so it requires some infrastructure. It's going to require a transponder probe, which we're going to use as the uh, targeting solution to deliver all of our other uh, packages. It's going to require an electrolyzer and a compressor, which will bundle up into something called machines. Um, package one. A picture of that cargo is actually uh, there in the bottom right. That is a UCGO cargo um, payload that I developed myself. I coded it up and I created the uh, texture file. It took me like two hours to do this one and there's like eight custom cargos. So the amount of man hours that I needed to do to, to create this mission was huge. I'm just glad that we're ready to fly it now. So that's that's what that looks like. Um, and then, of course, we need two tanks. We need a hydrogen tank. We need an oxygen tank to, to get everything started. And then eventually the solar farm. Um, so so to refuel, right? Okay, so we're, we're breathing. Um, we, 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 got, we got hydrogen. We got oxygen. So when we are up in the mothership, the docking bay will allow us to pull liquid oxygen, coolant, and hydrogen, and scram fuel um, from direct transfer from the mothership. So we take it out of the mothership tanks. It's not an infinite. It's not an infinite source, but we can transfer it like a, like a, a like a tanker. Uh, then we're going to use the ocean station, which again produces hydrogen, scram, breathing locks, and then we'll we'll pump ocean water through our our ship on the surface for coolant. Um, so that, that is how we will cool the, uh, the ship systems once, once we land in the ocean. Um, for Planet 8 and other sorts of you know, icy, icy bodies, um, we're going to need a heater, which again, I've also that's, that's another cargo that I had to develop. UCGO did not have it, so I had to make it. Um, the water storage tank, the machines package again, so we're going to manufacture that multiple times using a 3D printer. A solar farm, and then a hydrogen and an oxygen tank. And then for a vacuum station, which is basically, you know, if it's a very small body with no atmosphere, then we're just going to use uh, the exact same thing that we have with the ice station. Okay, food cycle, right? So let's see, you need, you need food, you need water, you need air, and you need shelter, right? The shelter is our ship, and in some ways the clothing that we wear. Um, the, the, the water comes from the ocean, or you can melt ice and elect, uh, yeah, just melt the ice and, and you're good. Um, and then uh, let's see, we, get, we said we got air, the air comes from the ocean, but now you need food. Um, so, so what are we going to do for food? We're going to um, we're going to pulverize rocks in space, and there's a cool UCGO um, plugin called the Jason Asteroid, which you can actually mine. We'll mine that. We'll package it up. Um, we will uh, munch it up into some dirt, grind it down to dirt, ship that down to the surface in uh, the ship. We'll pulverize it. That's another cargo, and that's that's visible on the in the lower right there. Um, then we're going to take some of the solid waste that we get from uh, the base, and we're going to mix it in with the dirt. That creates fertilizer, and you've got organic soil. And then you take that organic soil with seeds from a seed package, which we were smart enough to bring from Earth, better not forget that one because you're not making that with a 3d printer 
Um, we can use it to grow food, and that will create a little bit of oxygen. Not really that much, but it'll just kind of mainly keep the air fresh. But it, it's it's not it's not enough oxygen to sustain alone. And then uh, animals from a zoo, which again I remember to bring that from the earth because uh, that's try making an animal with a three D printer that actually is edible. I, I don't I don't think that's gonna happen. Um, so we that gets delivered, then they eat the they eat the um, the plants there, and just note that's gonna consume more than all the oxygen that's created by the by the plants. Um, so then you harvest the plants and the animals, and, and that's our food. So we need a dirt bin. That was a cargo, so great. I didn't have to build that one. A rock pulverizer, I had to make that one. Um, a seed package, it's labeled as food container, but it's really, it's really got a bunch of seeds that we then plant. The zoo, I had to make the zoo. Um, that, was, that was another cargo that I had to make. And a waste processor processor i had to make that cargo as well okay so i mentioned getting more real estate so here's here's how we get more real estate right so we're floating in the ocean um we we, we want to add on a panel so we take off we get into space we go to a moon or an asteroid or another planet that has actual rocks right we mine the rocks we smelt them down using a smelter that is the left of the two pictures on the bottom right and that was a smelter that was another cargo that I had to develop and then uh, you manufacture those with a 3d printer that's another cargo that I had to develop into a 345 right triangle prism unit right it looks like a block of cheese but it's a right triangle you then pack these triangle units into cargo units guess what that's another UCGO cargo unit that I had to build. And you might be able to see it right right between the two seven ship wheels. You might see something that looks like a block of cheese. That's it. So basically, that is an empty aluminum or iron con or steel container that we then fly down to the surface of the ocean. And it floats in the ocean, kind of like a ship. And the reason that they're triangles is as you build them, you just keep attaching triangles so you start with something that's like the size of a small boat and then you know eventually you'll, you'd end up with something the size of a cruise ship that could be multi-leveled or something but it all comes down to those three four five triangles um, that requires the smelter the 3d printer and the cargo prism units as i'm calling them okay um so some more things here i mentioned a mothership uh, that has some limitations for CGO. I had to test that out. Turns out that it, it breaks if it gets hotter than 800 degrees Celsius. <coughs> so I had to test that out, make some calculations, say, okay, the, um, the, the epsilon and the albedo of, of the, uh, uh of the, um, Mothership is about 0.85 or thereabouts. The, the epsilon, which is the emission, uh, the emissions coefficient is like 0.14. So what that means for us is uh, the, sh the, uh, the, the planets all the way down to Eta Crucis 4, we can use the mothership to get to. Um, for planets 3, 2, and 1, I don't, we're going to get too close to the sun uh, or the Eta Crucis, whatever you want to call it, to be able to visit those planets with the mothership. Uh, the mothership, unfortunately, I don't think is ever going to be able to make it to those planets. And um, more than likely, we're probably going to be looking at those pretty far off. I, I, I do not think we're going to be able to get close enough to, to um, really see it. And remember, um, Eta Crucis 1 is like 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's a death sentence if, if you get any word inside the atmosphere. Uh, it's, it's, it's a crematorium, basically. Okay, um, let's see. UCGO cargo spawning in the mothership. So I wanted to make sure that the mothership could create UCGO cargo instances. The idea is that we would use the 3D printer 
in order to do this? And the answer is yes. The cargos can be generated in the mothership. Um, however, the zoo and the seeds and the first 3D printer, those are primordial. You, you cannot build those. You have to supply them from Earth. Um, so then I had to build a Leif Erikson 2. It's going to have the angel white skin, which is blue and white, um, kind of, you know, matching the ocean. An ISP of 1082 for Instar. Um, we're setting a, a realistic oxygen consumption rate. Ox oxygen will only last a, a couple days on board, given the size of the tank. Um, hover engines are set to realistic. Now, the APU burn rate, I've always noticed, was very, very high. It was set to something like 20 pounds a minute. And I could never understand that because you're not running an entire engine. You're just running the ship's system, right? And so a um, an airplane engine called a Lycoming IO360, which is a 200 horsepower uh, avgas burning engine, it burns uh, on average about one pound of fuel per minute. So I said, okay, double it. That gives us a 400 horsepower APU, okay? It's not going to take 10 times that amount. That's that's just ridiculously high. So I, I, I lowered it to about 2 pounds per minute. Um, so hopefully that's a little bit more realistic of an APU burn rate. Um, I'm disabling ship damage while docked because it's, it's, it's under the protection of the mothership once it's on board. At that point, it's up to the mothership. The mothership breaks you know, because we go past those pressure or temperature limits, then, you know, it'll undock and destroy. So that, that's just done to smooth things out. Um, the cool thing about using a nuclear thermal rocket is that the chamber pressure of the rocket is 68 bar. So what that means is there's virtually no atmospheric reduction until you start getting into like the five to 10 atmosphere range. And even then it's only percentages. It's not until you really get above like, you know, 35 bar that you really start to see the, the weakening of, of the rocket engine, which is, which is very nice for, for deep atmospheric flights. Um, the, uh, the hull heating rate I've set to normal, no, no cheats there. And I've tested everything out to make sure that, that we're good to go. Uh, I also had to do some, some, tests on the earth just to see what happens um so so what i did was i figured out how much uh how much power the the uh, hover thrust would, would actually generate figure out the maximum gravitational um body um the, the gravity level where we would still be able to take off and then we'll match that to the planets when we get there i tried touching down so 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 slowly in the ocean but no it it never worked we we cannot get gear up in the ocean um it'll treat it the same way as a gear up on land don't do it okay um first descent to ada cruces seven so we had the five pixels but um i know i mentioned two moons and i mentioned some some rings the only thing that i'm going to say about that picture is the planet is not purple sadly not that one. Um, so I had to do an atmospheric test to make sure that we would be able to enter the atmosphere of Ada Crucis 7. So what I did was I, I, I went up higher on the earth and came in faster because um, I don't think we've ever established the size. Ada Crucis 7 is a step, step up larger from the earth. Um, if you compared Earth and Venus, you know, Venus is about 90% of the Earth size. The Earth is about 90% size of Ada Crucis 7. So it's it's kind of it's kind of where you start to get to the transition zone to super Earths where you're starting to talk about, you know, thicker oceans, thicker atmospheres on the way to eventually what becomes a a, a, um, a, a gas or ice giant type planet. Um, so so basically what we're going to do is, you know, the, the extraterrestrials are going to drop us off at our specific location at a very safe, very far distance from, from this world. Um, they're going to construct our orbit. Uh, we're going to check and make sure that if an inclination adjustment is required to avoid those rings. At that point, we will sign the document. We've been delivered. 
will undock from the mothership. Uh, I'm sorry, from the light ship. And then that's it. It just it goes away. And then um, we, we lower our orbit. We transfer our cargoes over, right? The, the probe that contains our, our radio transponder, two tanks, hydrogen and oxygen tank, and the machines package. We put those all on the XR2 Raven Star known as Leif Erikson. We'll undock the Leif Erikson from the Space Viking mothership, lower our orbit to 150 kilometers, and then we will deploy the Autoland probe to that sunrise location at 30 degrees south. That will allow us to collect atmospheric data that we can then feed into the atmospheric calculation programs that we will then use to chase atmospheric entry down on this vehicle and that will let us set up the base all at that um, at that beacon and yes we have to put the gear down even if it's in the ocean normally you would want to have the gear up but we can't really do anything about it um, and then we set up the uh, the refueling um, package hopefully and we can fingers crossed uh, demonstrate some some refueling um, I'm planning to land with full fuel so that if something goes wrong and we can't create fuel, then we have enough um, we have enough uh, in the tank to be able to get back to orbit. Uh, once we demonstrate refilling, then we can come down empty in the future. Uh, so one one um, gotcha with Ada Crucis Seven is it's an ocean it's an oceanic planet, but because of the extreme seasons. It gets cold enough at times for ice to appear. So there is actually a solid surface sometimes floating on the um, abyssal ocean. But, um, of course, you know, it's like sea ice on the earth. You can't build any permanent structure there because it'll eventually melt and fall through. Um, but, you know, it might be fun to go explore. So I just had to create some textures to in the back end to take care of that. All right, once we take off, we're going to fuel up, um, you know, top the tanks off, take off from Ada Crucis 7. We're going to put together an Ascent Delta V budget. I tested our um, our configuration to confirm that it can reach 8,138 meters per second, which is the circular orbiting velocity of um, Ada Crucis 7. For Earth, that's about 7,700 meters per second or so. For um, Ada Crucis 7, it's about 8,138 meters per second. So it's, it's like I said, it's a step up from the Earth. Um, we're going to take no cargo at all to guarantee that we're going to be able to make it. Then the idea is we're going to dock to the mothership and bring down the Stage 2 life cycle equipment, right? Remember, that's, the, um, that's, the, that's more of the bases. That's the food. Um, that's the 3D printer. That's the um, uh, stage two. Oh yeah, the solar farm. Okay. And now uh, the other thing that I had to plan was Ada Crucis Eight. This this was a this, this was extremely important that we got this right. So the circular orbiting velocity on Ada Crucis Eight is eleven thousand six hundred sixty meters per second. It is a fully fledged super Earth. Um, it holds no punches. And you'd better be ready. So, it it takes about uh, once you go eastward, it takes about ten uh, kilometers per second. And we need a booster, um, so we needed to um, strip. We're gonna need to strip everything down as much as we can. We're gonna take it as few people as possible. We're we're gonna use um, we're gonna use throwaway tanks. We're gonna use it's really five stages. Um, stage one is a fully fledged booster. Then stage two is we ignite some external tanks and then we jettison the external tanks and go to the, the auxiliary, auxiliary bay tanks. We, we burn them using the bay tanks. Then we throw away the bay tanks and then we use the, the main tanks and then we use the main tanks hopefully to orbit. If those don't empty, then we use the RCS tank, and we use the RCS tank all the way until we reach orbit. Or if we fail, that's really, really, really bad. Um, but I tested it. Um, we were able to reach that speed, and that's 
when you account for atmospheric loss and when you account for gravitational loss. So we should be good. Um, we had about 11% margin. So again, I think we're going to be okay. Um, let's see. First ascent. Uh, okay, yeah, here's here's the stages. So the, the, the rocket booster, the external tanks, the bay tanks, the main tank, and the RCS tank. The first time we're going to throw away the bay tanks just to make sure that we can reach orbit. Once we figure out what our margin actually was, then we can determine whether or not it is safe to keep the bay tanks. If we can keep the bay tanks in the future, then we will. Uh, one thing to note is if cargo goes down to eight, it's not coming back up. There, 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 is, there is no chance, none, that you are going to be able to haul a cargo up from Eta Crucis 8. It is just too big a planet. Um, you're, you're, com you're coming up bare. Okay, um, let's see. Yeah, note, do not uh, main engine cut off before the drop tanks are gone. Ada Crucis 8 will probably be several episodes in the future. It's 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 going to be a high water mark. It, it's not going to be like, okay, we did 7, let's do 8. No, it's not it's not going to be like that. It's going to be like, let's do 7. Let's do 7 again. Uh let's orbit the moon. Okay, let's go back to 7. All right, let's do the moon. And then like do the moon five more times and and then maybe we'll try 8. Um so I just have some emergency numbers here that says um, if the SRB jettisons and we're not doing more than 179 meters per second, that's a problem. Uh, if the external tank jettisons and by that time we're not at 440 meters per second, that's a problem. If the bay tank empties out and we're not at 2.4 kilometers per second, that's a problem. You see something like that, it means we're not going to make orbit. And I'm going to start getting really fearful. Um, okay, faster than light docking configuration, right? How are we putting all this together? Okay. <clears throat> so this is extraterrestrial uh, vehicle called the ARC-2. And then we, we have the Space Viking, which is an aero class ship. That is going to be tethered. We're not docking. We're tethering to the ARC-2 in a tractor beam. Um, that is not... Human technology, that's extraterrestrial technology, so don't ask me about that one. All I can tell you is we're, we're tethering in a tractor beam. Inside the Space Viking Aero Mothership, the XR-2 Raven Star um, Leif Erikson 2 will be docked in that docking bay. We also have a rover that we're taking with us called the the, the Azor. I think, I think I nicknamed it something. Um, oh, yeah, I called it the Runestone. The Runestone rover, which is which is an Azor class rover, it will be on board um, the Space Viking uh, mothership, and we can use the the rover will be able to go to the small like asteroids and moons. It will not be able to go to the planets. Um, there's no there's no way to safely deliver it to the surface. Okay, COPU. What does that stand for? Uh, critical on hand primordial unit basically means. You need to take this from the Earth, because if you don't, you're not making it. That's the zoo, that's the seed package in the form of the food container, and the 3D printer. Those three have to come with us from Earth. Um, the external tanks and the rocket booster, those will always all be produced in situ using 3D printers. Okay, um, let's see, Earth departure details. So, how we're going to leave Earth... Um, the, the extraterrestrial ARC-2 will be delivered to Earth um, to, to, to a 1,000 kilometer circular orbit inclined 30 degrees so that we can get to it from Cape Canaveral. Um, it will match the plane of um, Space Viking um, to make that easier for us. And Space Viking is being constructed in a 600 kilometer circular orbit inclined 30 degrees. So we take our three primordial cargoes, right? The zoo, the seed package, the 3D printer, load those into what's called the UCGO tray, which allows us to slide that tray into the Leif Erikson 2 space plane. We then put that space plane 
on the same type of booster that we're going to use in the Ada Crucis 8 scenario. Why? Because remember, the scramjet runs on hydrocarbons. It carries oxygen on board, which means in the Earth, you're trying to burn oxygen with oxygen. And that does not work. So, what that basically means is the scramjet is totally non functional on Earth. So, that means we take no scram fuel at all, but that also means now we don't have enough fuel to reach orbit, right? Because the, the nuclear, remember I said we're using realistic numbers here. The nuclear thermal rocket by itself does not generate enough power to reach orbit in a single stage, at least with the Earth. So we're going to have to launch it on a booster. The booster gets us up high enough for it to not matter. And then we use our, um, our regular old, um, well actually no, we are taking drop tanks. The drop tanks will fall away. We don't have any bay tanks though. And then we use the main engines to get into orbit. We will chase down and dock with the Space Viking mothership. Then the mothership will um, go up to uh, the Arc 2 and we'll tether into the tractor beam. Arc 2 will warp us to Ada Crucis 7 and we're going to stop very far away, about one third of the distance between the Earth and the Moon. That's just for safety, right? We don't we don't want to we don't want to get super close to the to the planet. Um, it's just not not a good idea, um, especially because of the rings. All right, uh, let's see. So I needed to do some back end work with the programming here. So I needed to add add it as a warp destination. We'll skip right through that. I created a custom atmospheric module based on Ada Crucis Seven. Um, Based, based on the actual numbers there. I'm not going to get too far into it because I'm not really supposed to know this information. But if I didn't create it, there would be no realistic world for us to explore. So I'm just going to breeze right through that. Okay, here we go. The Kopu, Critical On-Hand Primordial Unit. Again, we said Zoo, 3D uh, Printer, and their C package. Um, that's our zoo right there. Uh, so that is an ecosystem zoo. Uh, we got the warning contains live animals. And we got a nice picture of the earth on there to remember the earth by because we're not going back, at least in this video series. Okay. And then here's all the things that I had to do to, to, to make the mission happen. Um, not on here. I had to literally create the entire Ada Crucis system in orbiter. That took freaking ages but it was done. And then we had all this other stuff, the development, like I just said, I'm not gonna dwell on it. And then I had some more actions that I had to do to set up the scenarios, we're all set, all the simulation parameters are ready. We're mission capable, that's the, that's the takeaway. Uh, let's see, I had to do some tests with the, the probe just to make sure I knew what the probe was gonna do. <clears throat> It turns out that it can perform a landing on Jupiter. Don't tell me why or how I know that. Okay, uh, let's see. Then, yeah, I mentioned this test. This was the, the atmospheric entry test at, this, at the anticipated entry velocity for Ada Crucis 7. Um, the density is, is uh, higher um, because of a lower R value at Ada Crucis 7. There's a higher molecular weight in the atmosphere because of the hydrocarbons. So hey, if the heating is good enough on Earth, it's good enough at Ada Crucis 7. So this is just basically how I how how I did it. Um, okay, I will talk about the very last row, the entry difficulty score. So when I started developing um, uh, extrasolar planets. Um, one, one of the difficulties that I had right off the bat was atmospheric entry, right? That's one of the most challenging things you can do, right? And sometimes, you know, it can get too hot, it can get too dangerous to perform re-entry, so I, I needed a way to sort of explain the situation. So, um, when I was doing the, the space commutes, and, and we'll get back to more of those, um, what, what I needed to do was figure out, um, the the level of difficulty in um, the 
atmospheric entry. And so the way I did that was, was did a test and said, okay, well, what's the maximum temperature that my hull got to? And when we do it, we do it in a stall. And the idea is that if you were in a, in a steeper attitude, you're falling faster. You're getting less lift. If you're in a lower attitude, then you get more lift. So higher gravity means you're actually lower to the horizon. Lower gravity means you can be tipped up towards um, space. And so there comes a point where it's about 20 degrees where if you try to go any lower than that, it, you snap into the airstream and the whole craft rips apart like Columbia. So um, that's what happens if you try to enter on Jupiter. That, that, th there is a threshold where you cannot do it. So um, what I did was at that orbital velocity, I said, okay, what's the maximum temperature I got to? 1639, what's the minimum angle of attack that I needed to sustain um, reasonable flight? It was 37 and a half. So then what I do is I get a, a difficulty score, divide the temperature by the lowest angle of attack, that, and that gives me my re-entry score, which is about 43.7. I think Earth is about 36 or so about. Um, it's, so it's, it's a little bit worse than Earth, but it's entirely doable. Um, for reference, a very difficult, like uh, a, a mission failure level scenario would be about 2,000 degrees, that's about as hot as the hull can get without the ship breaking, and 20 degrees, um, that's about as low as the angle can get without the ship um, connecting with the airstream and, and resulting in a wing overstress event breaking the ship apart. So if you do the math, it's 200 divided by 20, and you're left with 100, which is perfect. So that's basically to say that if the reentry score is higher than 100, it's fatal. You can't do it. If it's zero, then it basically means that you can just come spitballing into the atmosphere however you please. It's 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 not dangerous at all. 43.7. It's kind of in the middle, which is like you better be careful, but you have some margin to play around with. All right. Uh, let's see. Then we did an ascent test for um, Ada Crucis Seven. I, I mentioned that. Um, yeah, went well. Um, so let's see. We we had to reach um, for for Earth. I think it ended up turning out to eight eight thousand one hundred thirty eight meters per second at two hundred thirty four kilometers. So what I did was I I took I took the the V circ for um, Ada Crucis, oh wait a minute, this is seven. Yeah, okay, I took the, the v circ for Ada Crucis seven, and then took a look at the density profile, took a look at the gravity, and then normalized it for Earth, and then said, okay, um, this is the speed that I need to get to um, for, for Earth. So it was 8,138 meters per second at 234 kilometers. And we were left with 1.4 kilometers per second. And we could have also dumped the excess scram fuel overboard if we were really that worried. So I think we're good. This was an attempt that I tried to do called slow orbital pickup. Uh, it didn't work. Um, you need you need uh, some sort of uh, automatic guidance for this to work. But basically the idea is, well, okay, maybe if I run out of fuel during the ascent, I can slow the mothership down and get just close enough to be able for, for me to dock. I'm, I'm, I'm really good at docking. I can dock in like 20 seconds. I've done it before. The problem is I can't get the two ships to get close enough for, for that docking to occur. Um, I tried like five times um, on, on Earth. You can't do it. Um, it's, it's not happening. Um, and then this is me trying to build a cargo unit. So I just made up a whole bunch of different... Uh, a uh, bunch of um, instructions and then that became this process so that is how you develop a UCEO cargo unit and I had to do that eight times to get all of the cargo units that we need to do this mission and um, oh yeah so one of the things is the bases can actually produce resources so that means eventually we should be able to automate production of those base prisms 
just by having people mine those mine constantly and we'll end up with base prisms that we just land we pick them up and we take you know kind of like the real world um it's like a you know a train you know you pull up to the siding you load the cars in you pull away from the siding you take the train to another location and, and unload it just like that okay uh limitations we're mission capable um the atmospheric ren uh reduction of the engine is not simulated and we have to manually do that for atmospheres with or sorry planets with thick atmospheres i don't know how much we're gonna get involved with those because those are those are all less than seven which means those are varying degrees of toastiness um no other atmospheric module other than seven is made so that means i have to do more coding before we go somewhere else and I got lazy and didn't do all the moons for Planet 8 and Planet 10, but we'll, we'll take care of that another time. All right, so this is pretty much the end of the, the, um, the episode um, to introduce everybody, but just, just to get everybody excited. Um, 11 Planet System, it's a very colorful system. Um, it's, it's a lot different. It's, it's a lot different from the solar system, um, but... <clears throat> I mean literally colorful. We have just about a planet or somebody that is just about every color of the rainbow, including brown and gray and silver. Uh, it's going to be fantastic. And the great thing is, it's it's all um, it's all it's all um, procedurally generated um, from Space Engine. So how about that? So I will see everybody next time. So the goal of the next episode will be taking off from the Earth. And we're hoping to finish the episode bobbing up and down in the waves of Ada Crucis 7. I've been Dr. Aeronautics, and I will see you guys next time for the next episode. Bye-bye. <laughs>